Yeah, you know what? Right, gone for bread. And we're back with Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling, and of course the website is Europe Business B U S I N E S dot blogspot dot com. And again, it's one S. You can go to just Google uh, Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling, and of course the Europe News Blog. You talk about the second update, and you have two updates, I guess, today. Uh, getting lots of hits, of course. We well, are there's 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 uh, a lot happening. Uh, we keep moving towards the cliff, and we're just about falling off the cliff that will be the Third World War, or at a minimum, a nightmare uh, in the Middle East, which will be connected to the economic crisis that continues to go down the tubes. And, um, you know, it, it just it doesn't get better. It seems to get worse. For instance, NATO has now launched war games in the, in the Mediterranean, and they've got uh, a German, a French and Turkish frigates uh, operating uh, real close to Syria. And, you know, I mean, it's just uh, they continue to pour uh, gasoline on a fire. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's just crazy. But anyway, uh, Syria destroyed uh, a group of five uh, Turkish cargo trucks that happened to be inside Turkish territory. And, of course, they were working, uh, operating in cooperation with the, the so-called opposition, the foreign mercenaries. Um, just a couple of days ago, there was a story that 10,000 uh, mercenaries had managed to make it across the uh, border in about a day's time into Syria. Uh, the Syrians are actually, they're very tough, and they have fought, they have outfought the foreign mercenaries uh, several times and come very close to uh, uh, to total success, but the uh, Saudi royal family and the Omani royal family they come up with enormous sums of money uh, to to get these poor Arabs uh, from all over North Africa Cannon to uh, Cannon sign up and become and a mercenary. Other than and being I, able to handle a gun, uh, but most of these people are going to walk in not having any weapons or tra- tactics training. They're going to walk in and be in cannon fodder to a very hardened uh, Syrian army backed by Russia and China. And China is very quiet, but I guarantee it that, the, as you mentioned before the show today, something very significant. So those people are military advisors. We know that a transcript, particularly of this hour of the show every week, is transcribed to Homeland Security, CSIS in Canada, the, home, uh, the uh, FBI, et cetera, and other government departments because they want to know three things. Number one, what questions are they asking? Who are the guests that are on Deagle's show? And why do they know these things? And you sent something today that I found was very shocking, that Russia and China co-developed the S-300 anti-aircraft system. Now S-400. the foreign minister... The, yeah, the, the S-400, S-400 is... The follow-on to the S-300, the S-300 has been the best air defense system bar none, far better than the Pac-3 that the United States have. But the the S-400 uh, is is the successor to that, and in fact, the... um, uh, the Chinese co-developed it, and they call their version the HQ-19. They have three different, that system has three different levels of rockets in extreme long range, and it can literally shoot satellites down, uh, and then a long range, and then a medium range. And often with that system, they'll have short and medium range other systems, wheeled and tracked systems. These are great, big, by the way, the S-400, S-300 are enormous, kind of like trucks, but they're designed to be able to go off-road in the field, and they carry four of these large missiles. Um, they're just, they're, 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 think of the largest semi-truck and then make it six times bigger, uh, twice as wide and, well, three or four times longer. Wow. And that's what they look like. And they, they, they can erect and fire these things. And they can erect and fire them in, um, in less than 20 minutes. So we don't, I, and to be honest, the United States doesn't have a system anywhere near that good. Now, here, uh, here's what the implication is. Uh, and the question is, Tim, if the Syrians and the, and the 
Iranians have these systems, and they're saying they may release them. In fact, they're saying there was a 2010 letter from Mr. Medvedev, the, the then uh, president of Russia, that you know now he's a prime minister. Okay, he's they switched jobs. With yeah, yeah. Putin back. Okay. Putin, but, Putin is the the boss. Putin, but Putin anyway. is the boss now for four terms with the switchover because they had constitutional law in in Russia, and they're probably going to change it so Putin can stay the. The, the you know the boss the non vodka drinking Russian again remember they invented vodka so Russia wouldn't take over the world well guess what Mr Putin doesn't drink vodka I, I so, had a Russian girlfriend after my wife died that her husband or her her husband her father was in the uh, Sputnik program and he was the rare Russian that did not drink. Uh, and I know some Russians that don't drink very much, but uh, but many of them do uh, tend to bend the elbow quite a bit. And when, and when Russians they don't drink, it. believe me, it's it's kind of like teenagers. Is how fast can we pass out? <laughs> right. Well, the thing is, though, when Russians don't drink, they're some of the most brilliant, amazing people on the planet. And yeah. here's what here's what we have to really realize: the Russian physicists are the best on the planet. The Russian military advancement in the past 20 years since Glasnost and Perestroika, when we purposely sent we call economic terrorists in to destroy the Russian economy, which was by, on purpose, which caused the collapse of the Soviet Union, was all by design. The Russians didn't forget that. They built a system to be, be built on the idea of the chinks in our armor and the weaknesses in our systems, including the new Topol M missile, these S-400 systems they co-developed with China. And the fact is, and you know this note there, you cannot get into Syrian or Iranian airspace. If you try and you probe with more jets and more aircraft and more missiles, you're going to find that it's going to get shot down. Now, what are the dangers of that? The dangers are, uh, yes, they're trying to put special forces on the ground to get inside Syria and Iran. The Syrians have actually mined all 550 miles with the Turkish border. The Turks basically are idiots. They're going to use this cannon fodder because if they put another NATO Syria Turkish jet across Syrian airspace, it's just going to get shot down. And if they start trying to incurs with Syrian air forces across the Syrian border with Turkish troops or NATO troops, they're going to get blasted. The they're Turks gonna... are, are a very corrupt country, and my personal opinion is that the prime minister has been well taken care of financially by uh, the Gulf cooperative states in the uh, U.S., Britain, France, that uh, are in the uh, you know are doing the globalist bidding, and he's selling his country down the river. There have been a number of very prominent Turkish politicians that have said much the exact same thing, that we don't need to be in a war. We've always had good relations with Syria until you started this nonsense. And quite frankly, if push comes to shove, the Syrians can lob some very, very nasty missiles with uh, 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 some very nasty chemical or radiological or uh, advanced biological warheads on Turkish cities and take out millions of people without even working up a sweat. Exactly. And, no, they, and, and they also, and the, the Iranians the, and the, Pakistanis the are fully ready to. about all this is, you know, uh, both sides, the Israelis, uh, the common thing is, oh, they've got two or three or maybe 400 nukes. Well, they've been saying that for 10 years or more. I think they probably have closer to 1,000 nukes of all. Yeah, they got a, what I heard right. is they have at least uh, between eight and 900 minimum, and these are multiply targeted so. warheads. They have their own image sat system. I know I talked to the Israeli people and the people inside the Mossad that actually are involved directly but, but, with the satellites. But here, here's the thing, Dr. Bill. But okay. dead is dead. We've right? got, yeah. They've yeah. got, uh, we can kill the other side 10 times over. Yeah. They only yeah. have to kill us once. They can probably kill us three times over. Okay? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. who wins a battle? like that. Well, Satan, but you're all dead. Okay, well, we can kill you more than you can kill us. Bottom line is, we kill you, you kill us, we assume room temperature, sayonara, you know, don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out, it's over, hasta la vega, baby, you're dead, we're dead. Who won that battle? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, of course, all of this is occurring as a big distraction with the Mideast War uh, while they're percolating, trying to replace the current world financial system with a new one, which is biometric, which is, i.e., the mark of the beast. And people say, oh, that's exaggerating, Dr. Deagle. Well, no, I'm gonna no. Give you... no, no, no. No, no, no. In fact, I got an interesting email here, 70 Reasons to Mourn for America, and I'll run through a few of these, and you'll understand exactly why we're in so much trouble. And it's apathy is the worst sin of America, apathy. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. Now, if you want to support what we're doing here at Nutramedical, you need to get your nutraceuticals completely and only from Nutramedical.com, and that means you're going to allow us to expand the number of shows and the number of people. Hello? Website up on uh, the live stream channel, livestream.com. You're going to be able to increase the amount of, of spread we have to different stations around not only the country and the world. And uh, our analysis of the topics, I believe, is deeper and more comprehensive than any other show on radio or television because we bring in the spiritual, the physical, the dynamic, and we actually have contacts, military and otherwise, and expertise that allows us to have a whole look at the picture. Now, I want to go back to something prophetic. In 1988, I got the first chapters face down on the concrete of my basement uh, uh, in Enfield, Nova Scotia, after I came back from Georgia. And the very first vision I had that I was shown supernaturally, the very first one that you'll see in clay and iron was that I was taken high above the earth and I looked down and I was shown by the angel the area of, called the Strait of Hormuz. Well, I didn't, I've never heard about the Strait of Hormuz. He said when the a, Strait of Hormuz closes, this is the start of the troubles to the nation of Israel and the whole world. And guess what? Their buildings have dropped in half in Iran to half what it was in 2011. We have the, them doing war games, getting ready for a war that if they start this, most of the population of Earth is going to die. And the uh, world will not a be good, a fit place to survive. I linked on my blog today, uh, Dr. Bill. The, the headline is Canadians protest against endless wars as Western backed destabilization in Syria threatens world peace. And uh, let, me, let me read two, two of the chapters real quick because it ties in exactly what you're saying about the Strait of Hormuz. Many observers are now humoring the possibility that the globalist dreams of a third world war may actually come to, come to fruition. An epic battle between good and evil is being fought right now, and if things escalate, it could turn into thermonuclear war. The world is growing increasingly hostile. In these quickly evolving situations, it's useful to recall that at any moment, Iran has the option to close the Strait of Hormuz, which would be devastating, especially if in concert with the planned implosion of the world's economy. It is also safe to assume that in such a situation, the ongoing weather wars that have ensured under the radar would likewise be ramped up. Okay, let me explain how the street could be closed. It may not be these little uh, Iranian gunships with their short-range missiles on. All it has to be is an email to Lloyd's in London or the insurance companies for these large single-hull tankers that go through the Gulf. They're not double-hulled, most of them, that could, would carry this oil and the hydrocarbons and whatever types of fuel they're carrying and just say, we're going to close it. And in advance, we're going to give you some warnings so that you can change your insuring. Now, of course, the big losers in this are going to be the insurance companies. Now, Lloyd's and of London, the insurance and 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 once and, the insurance and the, is the owners in, of the ships will say, "Oops, we're not sending our ships in." That's all you have to do. You don't need any gunships. You don't need anything. All you need to do is say the threat is now realistic because we passed legislation, which literally yesterday and the day before, the Iranian parliament is now saying we have no choice now. They've already cut our shipping in half. The Europeans actually did it to actually literally commit economic suicide to the pigs nations. You know, <laughs> I can't believe that they did this. It's, it's hard to believe in Europe. They're already in trouble financially, and they're going to drive the price of fuel even higher. And even the fuel that was being delivered, like to NC in Italy, they're not going to deliver it because they're saying, well, you guys aren't fixing this problem, and you continue to aggravate it, so we're just going to cut you all off preemptively. So now the Iranians are in half there. Now they're trying to, to, to barter for food stuffs like, like grain. And the Indians can't supply the right quality of grain, so they're having trouble with the right quality of grain. Now they're having trouble with getting the right size of ships to even deliver to the Iranian oil refinery ports from Iran to have to get the right kind of ships. Otherwise, they won't be able to get into their little ports. This is a nightmare that they were creating well, we'll now. Get to, uh, one of two things is going to happen. Um, Something will trigger, and it could be just uh, a, 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 a an officer on a, a ship or anything, uh, because everything's on a hair trigger. Something will trigger the war. It could be deliberate. It could be accidental. Or we will get to the point where either Syria or Iran will be so hard-pressed by what's happening to them that the, their leaders will sit down and rationally say, we have reached the point 
that we can no longer continue. Right now, we have the military capacity to hit back and take our enemies with us. Okay, you're a logistic we continue, expert. We will not have that capacity shortly. Yeah, so, Tim, you're a logistic expert, okay? And your mind works differently than a lot of people. You've got what I call a polydimensional mind that can actually look in the battlefield. Oh, uh, my supply lines are here, my troops are there, my material is here, this is defensible, this is... Logistics isn't. is the ball and chain of, of modern warfare. Right, now here's the point. It's also the ball and chain of a nation. If you start choking off like we did Japan, which caused Japan to come into the Second World War, if you start choking off Iran and Syria, and eventually their entire population of Iran of 80 million, and about 30 million in Syria start starving to death, or certain sup uh, basic staples are not even on their table, what the hell do you expect is going to happen? Well, it's not just, by the way, a Syrian problem. The war will begin one of two ways. Either you begin deliberately or by accident. That's one. Uh, it's but a matter quickly. of time. It's logistics. Or, or, how many months, uh, how many months uh, can you go like this? They will make a rational decision. Our backs are against the wall. We can't take any more without losing our ability to hit back, and it's time to hit back. And when that happens, they will launch. And when well, they launch... Katie, bar the door. Well, here's what I expect to happen. I think that we are looking at an October surprise. I think between now and October, a series of disasters is going to happen. Fukushima is going to release radiation, which the damn Japanese aren't going to release. TEPCO isn't going to release. And the IAEA, and even our senators aren't responding to me now. When I contacted the Senator Wyden, it's now three and a half weeks. I have no response back. And, in fact, I'm so disgusted with the fact that I hear I'm an expert. I also, by the way, have been asked to do the keynote address and speech to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine in October to the entire academy of top doctors in the world this October by Dr. Ray and Dr. Ogilvy as the current standing president. And yet, these people in the Senate have the nerves to not respond to me. I want a damn response. I'm getting tired of this. I deserve well, some respect. Is, uh, Fukushima is part of a, of a population reduction operation. Well, it's more than just population reduction. It's, mild disasters. They, they have they to create enough disaster. It's not just killing, though. Before they kill, they want to decimate the middle class. They want us desperate enough. And I know you said before the show, people are prepping. They're not prepping right. They're not storing water and nutrimeds and other things to keep themselves well. They're getting well. guns they're, together, though. They're, they're getting guns, but guess what? Guns won't do you any good when you have no bread and no water. Give me an example logistically. This is something I found out with the September 8th uh, problem last summer. And I'm, I'm a logistic mind as well, so I thought it was... A, I called up the local district, and I said, well, what happened during the local district? Because they gave us water warnings within like six hours after this happened. I said, why would we get water warnings? So I talked to the local engineer here in Southern California. He said, well... All the fire departments have emergency backup diesel generators to pump water. But none, and that means large letters none, none of the sewage treatment plants in any U.S. city or any city in the Western world has backup emergency generators for sewage treatment. So the reason why they shut off the water in cities is because after so many hours, they can't treat the sewage, so they stop pumping the water. And if you're not real lucky, it will back up in your house. Right, but here's the point. When you have no water, you're dead in days. That's the Liverpool protocol. True. Three to four days, no water, you're dead. No kidding. Back in a moment. And uh, we also have Chris Harris. Uh, Chris, are you there? Hello, Chris, are you there? I guess I don't hear Chris, so we'll see if we can connect with him. Yeah, we're going to we'll connect back. Uh, by the way, I just want to give the headlines, and he'll give us more details. Collapse of spent fuel pool, uh, fuel storage at Fukushima Daiichi could be worse than initial accident says. And we have that report. The collapse of the uh, already tilting reactor 4 at the stricken Fukushima Daiichi plant atop sits a spent nuclear fuel pool containing 1,535 fuel assemblies, including 204 unused ones, would lead to a significant global impact by far topping last year's triple meltdown at the plant, the report states. Uh, now that you're back, Chris, I'd like you to give us a kind of a summary of how bad this could get. And we're looking at a situation where on Tuesday at 4 a.m. Japanese Standard Time, JST, 
there was going to be a critical temperature rise to the level where these fuel rod assemblies were going to start popping their corks like champagne bottles sitting on the tarmac in Phoenix Airport at 120 degrees in the middle of July. And now we're looking at the situation which is basically being held together by duct tape and chewing gum, and it's going to blow. And as I said before, I expect by the middle of July we're going to have a major burp, and not the, not the end, major burp of radiation. It may not even be reported until we see radiation sickness, and the bloggers and the other people in Japan start panicking because they realize, and they're listening in Japan, and they're protesting like crazy, but the Western news isn't covering it all. You don't see anything on BBC or on regular networks talking about how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of Japanese and citizens all around the world protesting the actions of the Japanese government to burn trash, to reactivate the Ohai uh, reactor, which is sitting right on a fault line, which is having recent activity, and TEPCO's actions in terms of cooling pool 4, which are basically ridiculous. And this is going to blow really soon. Tell us how bad it is going to get. Well, you know, let's, let's get, um, let's talk about Unit 4. Uh, unit 4, the spent fuel pool cooling system, was reestablished. Uh, yes, I know. They, I, I, that term reestablished was really, it's like one of these uh, B movies. Reestablished means we managed to, 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 to tape in a pump outside the other pump which doesn't really work very well. We don't know how the integrity of the seal is, because you released this a few weeks ago, and it's up on e and &E News, uh, Chris, and it's all over the world now. Your audio was actually turned into a YouTube along with uh, Tim. And then, of course, when they did the follow-up, we had a follow-up when I was back. They put that up also uh, on e and &E News. Hopefully this will also go on e and &E News so they realize that the seal integrity, they're not putting doing any ultrasound of the seal or any x-ray to make sure the metallurgy is still intact. They're not doing anything to make certain because, as you said before, if the seal breaks, it doesn't matter how many pumps they put there, they're not going to be able to maintain the water levels adequately to stop it to hit critical temperatures to cause it to explode. So That's it's right. only uh, a matter of time before this damn thing goes. It's not a matter of if, it's better when it's going to happen. I think it's earlier rather than later. Right, and, and uh, you nailed it with the chewing gum and, and duct tape comment because what failed on the spent fuel pool cooling uh, system was something called the uninterruptible power supply, which didn't live up to its name and became interrupted. And they weren't able, and this is what happens when you put uh, makeshift flimsy systems, in this case an electrical system, back together again to use uh, in place of what was supposed to be a robust system, but of course it got flooded and you couldn't use the electrical distribution system anymore at that plant. And now you have these off-the-shelf items like this uninterruptible power supply, then you got to send people in that, you know, get more dose and to, to fix the thing. What they ended up doing was bypassing it. In other words, running an extension cord around it. Exactly. Which, yeah. In other words, they add an extension to an extension. And you know when you have an octopus, whether it's pipes piping things in, they're going to have leaks. They're going to have mm -hmm. a lack of integrity. And the same with electrical systems. And the darn thing stop connecting electricity, and also these pumps are leaking. We know that they're not maintaining the water level in the cooling pool. It's just a matter of time before the thing blows. Right. It's exactly what we've been talking about for a year now. The big concern is how you're going to make all the functions that, that were supposed to be made with the normal plant equipment, how you're going to reestablish all these functions. And that's, there's a great example of that right there. And so you couple that with a few other uh, other. Uh, uh, poor planning, natural disasters, and, and anything else you got, and you're going to find yourself in the same situation again, and in this case, probably even worse. Well, so, we, I posted up a video the other day on our live stream channel with a Japanese expert quoting, a nuclear expert from Japan, that they have to put in a new crane and a new superstructure to be able to remove the fuel rod assemblies right away. But they haven't done even square one. They put a, a cap over the top of which interferes with even putting injecting water into the top of the tank and interferes with the ability to actually extract these fuel rod assemblies. So everything they've done has been screwy. Everything they've done. They have increased the weight on this structure, which you don't know if it even has structural integrity, which is bulging three to four times more than they expected, and leaning and tilting. And then they don't know how far the uh, the, the water, the seal around the reactor uh, cooling pool is actually how it in structural integrity. And these fuel rod assembly bundles aren't going to come out easy because they're all bent and twisted. How the hell do they expect them to come out of there easily even if they put a crane in? And who's going to operate it? Is it going to be done remotely by a robot or a person that goes in there and after so many minutes they've been so blasted by radiation, they're, they're going to be sitting there drooling and dying. 
that's a possibility. And, uh, yeah, right now the planning, first of all, we've never planned for this before. They're not planning for it now because Mo Lowry and Curly are doing the planning, it appears. And right. so there, there is no way that uh, anybody's got the real big picture driving and, this to, to conclusion and, because and there isn't <laughs> They're also in La La Land. I watched a video, and I was just disgusted by the Japanese, you know, jumping up and down about their bets on their horse races, which are a few miles away from Fukushima. They just reopened the Fukushima Raceway. I'm thinking, you people are nuts. Do you know how close you are to the Fukushima Daiichi plant? The wind goes your way, and you get a big burp of radiation. Your horses and you people are going to start dropping dead almost instantly. Yeah, well. And if not instantly, you're going to start saying, gee, Ma, how come I'm bleeding from all my gums? got blisters all over and i'm passing bloody diarrhea and i'm feeling so weak i don't think i can stand up well guess what you're dying because you had a massive radiation exposure and uh you know that you know so that that in itself is uh it shows that there is no planning it shows that there's no oversight and it shows that just as we've been talking about for a long time there is no adult supervision and no. uh the bottom line is driving the show, the bottom line being what the bean counters want, and uh, the whole, everything else about regulations, everything else is just for show. That's all it is, and it's... Um, yeah, well, they put yeah. steel pillars in there to support the pool, but they don't even know if these steel pillars can handle it, the extra weight that they added recently with that cap. Uh, and if I put a steel p- pillar, what if, what do I mount the steel pillar? What am I transferring the load to, something that's also flimsy? You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. I go ahead and I got this steel pillar here. Well, what, am I just, is it going to just punch right through the floor and through cracks and everything else? Exactly. There's no, no. analysis. No, no, the April report you quoted, which we, by the way, grabbed and we posted up uh, back a, a month or so ago now, uh, that you quoted again on the 14th and the 22nd, uh, sec, uh, 21st of this month, of June. Uh, that report, what was the name of the scientist that uh, you quoted uh, back in April that actually? Dr. Gailey. Dr. Gailey, and you also quoted Gailey. I want you to give the data again as to how bad Gailey's calculated out the release of radiation just from the corks of these things popping, of these fuel rod assemblies, in terms of what the consequences are, just in in terms of talking like uh, strontium-90 or cesium. The amount of radiation being released is such a huge amount compared to even the release last March. It blows your mind. And, And our Western governments, our U.S. government, while they're playing around with their politics and their election, they're not facing the fact we're dealing with a global catastrophe, not just a Japanese catastrophe. We're talking about a global catastrophe where more than 80% of that radiation is coming our way. And it's not just going to dump over just America and Canada. It's going to dump over Europe and Russia and China and everywhere, the Northern Hemisphere. And don't think be real, be real smug in the Southern Hemisphere. You're going to get, get a good whiff of it as well. There's jet streams that will carry that radiation south of the equator as well. But you won't get as much as us, but you're going to get hit hard too. This is a global catastrophe in the making, and combined with our food shortages and our crop failures and climate shift, this is going to get nuts. And people don't understand, this will bring in a real big October surprise if it happens before the election, which I expect. Exactly. Exactly. Chris, can you summarize what you see happening with TEPCO and what's happening in Japan? And then also here at the NRC, I haven't heard a peep out of the NRC now that they've got rid of JASCO and have the new uh, safety director there. Um, what's going on in Japan? What's happening here in terms of the danger of our reactors losing their backup power or extreme weather causing major problems we've had? Just the start now of the tornado season, and last year we had a lot of tornadoes and extreme weather putting our plants, our nuclear plants, in severe jeopardy. Earthquakes are increasing worldwide, and there's 75% of our of our reactors are within strike zone of a major quake. We're not prepared in any way, shape, or form, and now that they've gotten rid of a rule maker like JASCO, we're in even worse shape. Uh, what's happening in, in TEPCO in Japan, and how likely is the timeline a matter of weeks or months rather than years away from a real catastrophe there? Well, according to some of the experts that have uh, in Japan, right, right close and personal to the problem, they just put out a report, and these are uh, independent experts, you know, just like uh, folks who really know what's going on, and yet they're not affiliated with the government or, uh, or directly with, with TEPCO, they put out a report. And 
they're painting a pretty grim picture right now. And I did send you an article on that. Yes, I got that, yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 you know, they're, they're saying, hey, basically, due to recklessness in design, engineering, operation, construction, management, etc., this Fukushima was a man-made event. Not man-made because the earthquake was man-made, but it could have been, you know, it, it could have been avoided or it could have been certainly minimized the effects of it. And so because of basically, um, well, just negligence and, uh, and even bordering on, if not crossing the line, malicious negligence, uh, this was a man-made event and it didn't have to happen. Exactly. So planning, yeah. And so, uh, and, and um, if I, I guess I would, I would say right now, a similar group of experts have just also published uh, findings that the Ahi plant that is, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, which yeah, is being, yeah. they're trying to restart it anyway, they're having problems, but they're trying to restart it. It's sitting on three different fault lines, you know, that were previously unidentified or, uh, even worse, ignored. And so... Uh, and it recently shown some uh, some seismological activity. Uh, you've also got some other amazing reports here for what's going on in America in terms of uh, the event 48063, Prairie Island, North Minnesota, July 7th, 2012, which is not <laughs> I mean <laughs> <laughs> okay what happened there uh, yeah no, no, by the way 2012 hasn't even happened yet so why is it labeled July 7th I'm sorry maybe it was the wrong uh, I put it with the July 5th probably right? it was probably in other words it was probably really really recent like the last couple of days uh, oh, in a well, person yeah, well, yeah yeah it, it was just uh, yeah you, you, uh, just uh, two days uh, July 3rd actually. July 3rd I mean okay. July 3rd so so basically What's happened in that plant? Because this is an example of the comedy of errors that's occurring in terms of, sa of nuclear safety, lack of backup power, lack of even making, doing, a, you know, checking the pipes to make sure. Some of them, like you mentioned uh, out in uh, Illinois, where the pipes were so weak, we talked about this last year, that you could take a brush and go right through some of the pipes and the recirculator pumps. Okay, well, uh, we talked about a lot of external events and uh, their relation to earth changes. Right. And that plants are designed to be safe within a certain confinement, a certain, a certain area of operation. In other words, uh, you will never get an earthquake at North Anna greater than this, and yet they got one greater than that. So you know, in other words, so in, in the case, this is kind of unusual, up in uh, Prairie Island, which is way up in Minnesota, right on the lake, uh, if uh, the air can see, there are many different parameters. One of them is, you will never get an air temperature greater than 97 degrees at this location that's designated to be the official spot to take the temperature, which right. is actually 30, that's like 10 meters up in the air on a certain uh, uh, right. instrument that's up there. If it does exceed that, your diesel generators are not designed to respond well or at all at, at, at a temperature greater than that. So you have to say they're not operable anymore. I can't rely on them. And now, if we do have a loss of off-site power or something happens, which, you know, could happen in the summertime, uh, you can't really count on your diesel generators to be there. You know, and you end up, uh, you know, you end up losing their function. I, and it's so, uh, historically, this data was, was compiled, and they decided, you know, this 97 degrees is way above what we're never, what we're ever going to get. Remember, back in the 60s and 70s, you're never going to see 97 degrees out, up there. Well, they've exceeded it, and so they did have to declare those engi the engines in uh, inoperable, and they would have to take action. And sometimes, even in, and, and actually, all the times, you would, if you can't do something about it, you have to uh, start shutting the plants down because you can't uh, you can't go reliably. So I thought that was kind of unusual, and uh, the temperature did go back down again. It was ninety seven point one, and it. And it goes back, and that's how we watch things like that. But it is unusual that a plant would have to uh, declare something uh, inoperable based solely on temperature that uh, you've never seen before. And that goes along with what Tim was saying about the uh, crops drying up and high temperatures and everything else. It's even up in Minnesota we're getting uh, high temperatures right now. Exactly. So, and by the way, that uh, temperature, and this goes back to Tim and what we released over uh, two years ago now, with Dr. Zangari, John Moore, uh, Tim uh, Alexander, and myself. Uh, we released information. I even contacted, by the way, uh, the institutions here in America that were doing research with the uh, Frascati Institute and NOAA, the National Oceanographic Administration, 
And now that we've got this ongoing disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, the loop current is not connected, so that heat generator cannot pump that tremendous amount of heat generated in the Gulf of Mexico. The temperatures of the water are 7 degrees hotter. That heat is pumping up that heat into the Midwest, all the way from the mountain states, all the way through the East Coast and right up to the Northeast. That's the reason why it's so damn hot. And if some people who try to say it's global warming, they're crazy. What's happening is the engine of, of the Gulf of Mexico isn't working. And that's another factor. We could also have flooding. We don't have these reactors ready for, for flooding either. One of the things you talked about was the, uh, not only the diesels being inoperable, none of these are rated for these levels of, of earthquakes or rated for extreme weather. Um, and then to, to go back in the last couple of minutes here, the Japanese uh, seismologists are telling us they're having massive process everywhere, including the Ojai reactors. I don't know. I mean, what's going to happen? Are they going to wait until there's such a massive radiation release that people finally are, you know, there's blood in the streets and there's actual violent revolution? What do they want? Do they want people all over the world to be protesting and closing down the Japanese embassies? Because that's what's next. The Japanese have to stop burning trash. They need to allow international governments to come in there and help them to deal with this disaster before it starts killing people, not only in Japan, but around the entire world. Already we know the unborn are being killed in America since last March. It's a year and a half now, and we're doing nothing. And I get no response, by the way, from Senator Wyden. I think somebody talked to him. I think somebody has said, don't talk to Deagle. He's a problem child. He's going to cause trouble. He's asking questions we don't want to answer. He wants data that we don't want to give them. If we do know something, we're not going to let it out. What do you think, Tim? I think uh, we're looking at uh, globalist population reduction uh, operations at Fukushima and also uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. By the way, on my site, I've got a link to the RTOFS Atlantic Nowcast uh, that's part of the United States government. And I'm looking at it right now, and there is no loop current. None. Gone. Sayonara. And all that that's energy about- is just sitting in the Gulf. Right, the, the boundary zone between the, the different warm and colder waters, depending on salinity, is broken when an oil barrier breaks down that barrier. Therefore, exactly. the heat cannot escape in, an, in what we call an integrity loop current, a current where, where warmer waters that have a different temperature and salinity is literally has a physical boundary zone with, an, with adjacent waters. When that's gone, that heat cannot connect with the Gulf Stream coming off of the, the eastern coast of Brazil and the Caribbean current connecting to create what's called the 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 Gulf. The well, and and that it, the, the the Gulf Stream is a uh, a river of warm water in a in a cold North Atlantic, and the and it affects the atmosphere for miles above it, and that affects the, the atmosphere dis- controls the jet stream. Right, Ben Franklin was the actual one who discovered it. Changed over two years now. That's why two years ago you had 105 degrees in in, in Moscow in the summer, and we're having abnormal in in Argentina right now. They've had two week, uh, in the last two weeks they've had as much snow as they get in the entire season. The entire world's weather patterns have shifted because of the BP oil disaster, no. and none of the globalist uh, controlled mainstream media will say one word about it. Well, what's happening is famine. Just like uh, my ancient ancestor Joseph, we are facing famine this year. Not 10 years from now, not next year, this oh, yeah. year. By this fall, on a worldwide basis, we are entering famine globally. And it's tied in with the fact that we're with the release of radiation from Fukushima, the population's immune system will fail. And we're also facing, therefore, down the road, a pandemic of one or more pathogens. And if there's a Gulf War, people will have virtually no resistance to these pathogens if they spread. And again, we can stop it if we know what it is. As I say, my idea of optimism is to know what the truth is and to have a plan to survive and thrive, but it requires honesty and it requires action, and we need a lot of prayer to the Most High God to direct our actions. Get right with God. Tim, closing comments? and uh, yeah, Get right with God, because uh, with the carnicopia from hell is... Hi, Tim.